All right, so um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, pre-hospital um, pre ECMO. As you know, I'm uh, one of the HEMS doctors and I'm a cardiac anaesthetist at both Westmead and uh, RPA hospitals and I work as the ECMO lead at Westmead. Um, so we're proving that eCPR works to improve survival. We've basically taken a patient group that has a mortality or a life of 5 to 10% and we've increased that to 33%, which is amazing. The number of patients that are receiving eCPR is increasing. Our skill set and experience is increasing. But the numbers around the world, the survival rates seem to be stagnating. The survival rates still remain at 29 to 33%. So why, why are these survival rates stagnating? And I think one of the key factors may be the low flow times, the time from initial collapse to ECMO flow. Nearly all eCPR studies that we're seeing in the literature involve transporting the patient to an ECMO centre for cannulation. And obviously cardiac arrest is such a time critical pathology. For every 10 minutes of CPR beyond 30 minutes, there is a 25% increase in mortality. So basically, after 30 minutes of CPR, your intact survival falls by 2.5% per minute. <clears throat> Multiple recent studies and registry analysis have demonstrated that after 60 minutes of resuscitation, survival rates are poor and they really drop off the curve. So you can see in this study that if you had CPR for, le for less than 20 minutes, your survival rate was around 67%. And then if you had CPR for more than uh, 60 minutes, your survival rate was less than 6%. So minimising the time from the patient's collapse to restoration of good perfusion with eCPR is critical for, inducing the uh, for allowing the patient to have a good outcome. 60 minutes appears to be that golden hour of advanced cardiac arrest resuscitation. Now, there are a lot of challenges surrounding eCPR and providing an eCPR service, but I think one of the biggest challenges at the moment that we're facing is actually getting these patients onto ECMO flow in a timely manner. We really do underestimate the time it takes to extricate these patients pre-hospital. Paramedics, as you have seen today, work really hard to expedite patients that show signs of life during cardiac arrest. However, there are always going to be logistical challenges. Even if a patient has a cardiac arrest 10 minutes down the road from St Vincent's in a lovely Darlinghurst Terrace, you still need to do critical interventions, cannulate the patients, get an airway in the patient, apply a mechanical CPR device to the patient and then get them down those lovely flights of stairs to St Vincent's. This still takes around 35 to 40 minutes. The recently published AROCA trial, which basically was an RCT looking at expedited uh, transfer of patients in cardiac arrest to an eCPR centre, um, basically demonstrated the difficulties in getting patients to an eCPR centre in a timely manner. Um, they had two groups, the standard arrest group and then the expedited group. Now, unfortunately, they only enrolled 15 patients owing to coronavirus, but they still published their results. And they basically demonstrated that even in the expedited transport group, only 42% of those patients reached an eCPR centre in less than 30 minutes. Consistently, we're seeing, as we heard from RPA today, the best survival rates are with those cardiac arrests that happen in hospital and get onto ECMO in hospital. That's where the survival outcome seems to be. And I think a big part of why we're struggling with the out of hospital cardiac arrest population is the low flow time due to transport. We've touched on briefly, and Dimitri is going to be talking about this later today, but the Minnesota group are revolutionising eCPR and cardiac arrest management with a near 50% increase in survival in their eCPR cohort. In that group of survivors, they're basically demonstrating that if they get the patient onto ECMO in less than 30 minutes, they've got 100% survival. That's game-changing. That's really game-changing now. Now, obviously, these numbers are going to be very low, and this group, of, uh, this group of clinicians also face the similar challenges that we face. Their median extrication time or their time from collapse into ECMO flow is about 52 minutes and they're struggling to get ambulance scene times of less than 20 minutes. But they are demonstrating the exquisitely time sensitive nature of this process. So with the limited data that we have available, it appears that initiating eCPR within 30 minutes is how you're going to confer that extra survival benefit that we need to see with eCPR. And certainly new models of care with eCPR are starting to target this time frame.
Now, a big part of the amazing results at the Minnesota Group um, is due to the pre-hospital management. It's the early identification of these patients, it's the high-performance CPR that we saw today, and it's doing the bare minimum critical interventions in a timely manner and then transporting. ECMO is a very small link in this improved chain of survival. So how are we going to minimise the interval between collapse and establishment of ECMO flow? The current system, as we know, is to transport these patients to an ECMO centre. But the published uh, data is showing over and over again that we have challenges um, in getting these patients onto ECMO flow in less than 60 minutes. This study by Reynolds looked at the balance between advanced therapies and the risk of transporting patients meeting eCPR criteria. They found basically that 90% of neurologically intact survivors achieved ROSC within 21 minutes and that if you continued to have cardiac arrest after 20 minutes, the chances of a neurologically intact survival were only around 8.5%. So the philosophy of staying on scene and providing good ALS rather than loading and going is born out of these sorts of statistics. The best outcome for the patient is going to be in cardiac arrest is going to be early ROSC. It's going to be achieved with um, adequate defibrillation, early defibrillation, good quality CPR and reversing reversible causes. So typically 20 minutes of advanced resuscitation will occur before the patient is transported or consideration is given to uh, ceasing resuscitation. But what if, what if the ECMO team was brought to the patient? What if during that 20 minutes of high performance ALS, sheaths and wires were going into the patient simultaneously? What if when the patient doesn't occur, doesn't get ROSC in 20 minutes, then we proceed with cannulation and we get the patient onto ECMO within 30 minutes? We need to be pushing this survival envelope. We need to be looking at patients that don't survive now, but that can potentially survive in five to, years, five to ten years' time and think about how we can get there. And what about equity? With a pre-hospital strategy like this, patients who were previously located too far from an ECMO centre, like those in Western Sydney and South Western Sydney, are now potentially eligible, bringing greater, um, greater equity to the Sydney population. 60% of the New South Wales population is located in a 38 kilometre radius from Parramatta. Now that's nowhere near the two centrally located ECMO centres. And if you talk to the pre-hospital ECMO team in Paris, they will say that their pre-hospital ECMO service, or well, one of the biggest benefits of their pre-hospital ECMO service, has been able to bring equity to the, the citizens of Paris. They're now able to provide eCPR to patients that previously would have been ineligible due to distance. So if we reach these patients sooner and established ECMO earlier, would that then enable the selection criteria that we have at the moment to be broadened? Would we be treating, patient, treating more patients and then have a better understanding of the true survival benefit? Now, there are obviously some considerations to this sort of strategy. How long do we wait before someone is eligible, before we declare someone eligible for eCPR? Care's obviously got to be taken to start cannulating patients that may have achieved ROSC in 20 minutes anyway, because cannulation is not without risk. We're subjecting these patients to potential complications like limb amputation, uh, sepsis, um, vascular damage, and these patients may have gotten ROSC anyway. But if we wait too long, then how, we are potentially dooming these patients to a, a failed procedure. So where, where is that time frame? Where is that balance? And the question really does arise, should we be challenging all of this money into such a um, bespoke therapy for a select number of patients? Or is healthcare money better spent on public health, campaign, public health care campaigns, reducing the incidence of cardiovascular disease and improving bystander CPR with more defibrillators around Sydney? So let's talk about some of the uh, pre-hospital services that exist at the moment. And perhaps one of the most famous ones is the SAMU in Paris. The SAMU um, basically have been doing this for a number of years. They started in 2009 and they cannulate on average 60 to 80 pre-hospital patients per year. The whole aim of their service is to get patients onto ECMO in less than 60 minutes. Uh, recently, they've moved to a cut-down model, so previously they were accessing the vessels percutaneously, but now they've decided that to reduce the rates of vascular injury, they're actually going to do a cut-down. Their team is made up of one cannulator, one paramedic and an intensive care nurse, and the intensive care nurse is responsible for priming the cardio help and getting the, uh, the whole ECMO machine ready. 
Their selection criteria is, is pretty similar to the rest of the world's selection criteria for eCPR. Um, they're aiming for CPR to be commenced within five minutes. They do wait for 20 minutes of resuscitation to occur before they decide whether or not the patient is a suitable ECMO candidate. Um, and it obviously has to be a witnessed event, arrest. How they do it is that they have this simultaneous dispatch of a BLS team and the pre-hospital ECMO team once a cardiac arrest notification comes through. Once on scene, the patient's assessed as to whether or not they meet criteria, and then a cut down is performed two centimetres underneath the inguinal crease, and then you, you have predominantly blunt dissection down to the vessels. Now, they examined their, um, their outcomes from 2011 2000 to 2015, and they basically compared two periods. Period one was when their first service was in its infancy. During this period, they were waiting for 20 minutes before they were actually ad, um, activated, which resulted in a low flow time of around 90 minutes. They had about a 9% survival rate in this group. And then they had period two, period two, which was an earlier activation of the team. Um, they had a more uh, stringent selection criteria and they had a median low flow time of around 70 minutes. They increased their survival rates to 29% with this strategy. They also compared uh, both in-hospital and pre-hospital ECMO and they found no difference in outcome between the two groups if the patient was established on ECMO in less than 60 minutes. There is probably a selection bias in this group though, because to get onto ECMO in, in hospital, you need to maintain signs of life during that transport period. So those patients may have, may have had a, a survival benefit anyway. They still have an average low flow duration of around 71 minutes, which may explain why their survival rates are still around the 29% mark. But in a propensity matched analysis, they found that the pre-hospital ECPR group had a shorter low flow interval and a higher rate of ROSC. London HEMS, in conjunction with Bart's Heart Centre, are also developing their ECP, pre-hospital ECPR program. They recently published their sub-30 paper with the whole aim of their pre-hospital uh, ECPR group is to get the patients onto ECMO in less than 30 minutes. Um, they're demonstrating that this is a possibility with high fidelity simulation and they're now starting to enrol patients into this, um, this pre-hospital trial. They have an integrated team of two ECMO physicians, a pre-hospital physician, so a London HEMS physician, and an advanced care paramedic. The advanced care paramedic and the London HEMS doctor are purely responsible for managing the cardiac arrest and scene management. And then you have the ECMO consultants that are purely responsible for the ECMO machine and cannulating the patient. But their plan, uh, once this trial is over, is to make this skill set part of the London HEMS doctor's skill set. Um, so selection criteria, again, I know it's a very busy slide, but basically it's essentially the same, witness cardiac arrest. They won't commence cannulation until 20 minutes of cardiac arrest either. Um, and they, but they require activa for the activation to occur. The patients actually need to arrest within a 10 minute driving radius for where their car is located. So they have a dedicated ambulance with these physicians sitting in it in central London. Um, the advanced paramedic practitioner desk will um, activate the team um, as long as that car is 10 minutes in proximity to the patient. They obviously have a low threshold for deployment, accepting that they're going to have a high call off rate because uh, ECPR eligible patients are such a small group. Guide wires are placed shortly after they arrive on scene whilst all the information is being gathered and then they will have a team timeout at 20 minutes to decide whether or not this patient still meets eCPR criteria and if they do, they'll go into ECMO. Now, if they can't achieve ECMO flow in under 60 minutes, they'll actually abandon the procedure and declare the patient deceased. Berlin are also uh, performing eCPR and have done so for a, a while now. Their team consists of one ICU doctor and one ICU nurse. Their service is basically staffed by five intensivists and 15 nurses to basically cover shifts 24-7. They have no dedicated ambulance. They just use whatever's available and going to the cardiac arrest. Um, at night, these doctors are on call from home and I think the ambulance comes and picks them up. It's not a very sustainable model. In terms of their criteria, again, pretty similar, but they're going to start cannulation if ROSC isn't achieved within 10 minutes. Um, they have about a 20 to 25% survival rate um, with good neurological outcome. 
speaking to them the other day, though, they were they were saying that the barriers are being uh, are the fact that they're activated too late and that their time to ECMO flow, again, is greater than 60 minutes. Interestingly, in, in Germany, the first trigger word for a cardiac arrest is unconsciousness. Um, and But they say that a large proportion of their patient co- population is unconscious because of intoxication. So um, they won't actually be activated uh, until the first cruise on scene arrives. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and this is just an example of, of them performing uh, pre-hospital ACPR in random places. I'm going to touch very briefly on the Minnesota model um, because obviously Dimitri is going to speak about this later today. But their ECMO facilitated resuscitation program is completely changing the face of ACPR. Their model is really getting results. Um, And I really need to emphasise that they're getting survival rates of around 50%, um, and that's compared with survival rates of only 6.5% in the standard ALS uh, group. And again, I emphasise that if they get their patients onto ECMO within 30 minutes, they have a 100% survival rate at the moment, obviously a very small number. And these guys are ridiculously fast at getting patients onto ECMO. They have cannulation times between 8 and 15 minutes, which is incredibly oppressive. How their model works is they've got a 24-7 mobile cannulation team. They have three strategically placed uh, ECMO initiation centres um, that have an ED and a cath lab, and then they have a central um, single ECMO ICU, basically, that they bring the patients back to. The team is made up of a cannulator, a sterile assistant and a non-sterile assistant, um, and this team is, either, is, is made up of physicians, paramedics and nursing staff. So an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is going to be taken to one of these three um, ECMO initiation hospitals and then the ECMO team meet that patient there. The ECMO team have a KPI to reach that ECMO uh, initiation hospital in less than 15 minutes Um, and the aim of their cannulation time is also meant to be less than 15 minutes with an aim of a duration of low flow of less than 60 minutes. Their selection criteria, again, very similar except that their point of difference is that they have uh, resuscitation discontinuation criteria. So if a patient has two or more of the following characteristics, end tidal CO2 of less than 10, a PaO2 of less than 50 or SATs less than 85%, and a lactic acid of greater than 18, then they won't go on to ECMO either. They looked at 63 patients over a 16-month period. They had a mean cannulation time of 14.9 minutes. 63% were cannulated in less than 15 minutes, which is amazing. 47% of patients had a survival to hospital discharge with a good neurological outcome. And the mean CPR duration was around 52 minutes. So like I said, they're also struggling with this extrication time. Now I'm sure Dimitri's gonna talk a bit more about it today, but looking forward, They've got this truck now, this ECMO truck, that basically has a cath lab in the back of it with II. So they go to the scene of a cardiac arrest, they place the patient on ECMO with this II machine, and then they revascularize, which is incredibly impressive. So I guess to conclude, I want to say that it's not ECMO alone that's conferring the survival benefit. ECMO is acting as a bridge to get these patients revascularized and ultimately get ROSC and an organized rhythm. ECMO is just a very small link in the chain of survival. Without excellent pre-hospital ALS, diligent case identification systems, early activation, excellent pre-hospital care, these survival benefits aren't going to be a possibility. But what we do know at the moment is that we need to find a way to shorten the time from initial collapse to ECMO flow. The Minnesota group are demonstrating that we can actually do this. Their results are changing the face of cardiac arrest management. So we really do need to stop and reflect on patients that are currently not surviving, but potentially will survive in five years' time and work out how we can get there quickly. Wow. Great talk. Um, questions? Online that no, Bueller anyone no. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I quickly ask do you use ultrasound for your cannulation? Yes, absolutely, cool? absolutely, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Percutane, they're, they're actually showing that um, you'll get better results with percutaneous cannulation rather than cut down because you've got all of the vascular uh, complications associated with cut down, particularly sepsis, that happens when you do that in an ECPR setting. So we try mm. to do it percutaneously. 
And I think what you're describing there, Nat, is that it's the time to the definitive intervention is important, not the location. That's isn't right. It? And that's what we've kind of been doing in various other parts of medicine for years, particularly in trauma. It's the time to definitive intervention care um, uh, that should not be confined by walls, really. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If you can get a patient to an ECMO centre in 30 minutes, fantastic, get them on. But if you can't, mm. then we really need to be thinking about where we should be doing this.